There was a terror attack in Manchester last night. It was at an Ariana Grande concert. And the facts here are just absolutely gut-wrenching. So as of right now, as of this recording, uh, 22 people are dead. Last night, the number was 19, and that ticked up. Some people were taken to the hospital, many people with life-threatening injuries, and some of them indeed lost their life. I wouldn't be surprised if that 22 uh, casualty number rises more as time goes by. Uh, here's what the New York Times says about this. The Islamic State claimed responsibility on Tuesday for the bombing at Manchester Arena, the deadliest terrorist assault in Britain since 2005, as the death toll rises, or as the death toll rose to 22. The bomb tore through an entrance hall of the 21,000-seat Manchester Arena at about 10.30 p.m. on Monday as a concert by the American pop star Ariana Grande was ending and as crowds of teenagers had begun to leave, many for an adjacent train station. The pandemonium ensued as panicked adolescents struggled to connect with parents and guardians waiting outside to pick them up, as well as those killed dozens of other people were wounded in the attack. 59 were hospitalized, some with life-threatening injuries. The police said that they were canvassing leads and pouring over surveillance footage to determine if the assailant who died in the assault had acted with any accomplices. Shortly before noon on Tuesday, the police announced that they had arrested a 23-year-old man southwest of the city center with regards to last night's incident, but they did not provide additional details. Okay, uh, so CBS News has the most gut-wrenching fact about this. They reported late last night that uh, it's confirmed that many of the 22 who are dead are indeed a group of young girls, a group of girls who are, you know, uh, teenagers. So this is um, this is as disgusting as it gets. It's the worst kind of an attack. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw this number increase in terms of the dead. Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. I'm Aisha, your host. A few weeks ago, bombing in Manchester shook the world. One victim was as young as eight years old. Some were teenagers and some were middle-aged parents waiting to pick up their children from a concert in Manchester when hit by a suicide bomber. According to New York Times, a total of 22 people died and 59 were injured. How do we make sense of this horrific crime? And how does someone commit such a crime in the name of Islam? Let's sit down and talk to Dr. Shabir Ali and try to make sense of this. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shabir. Pleasure to be on. So what, uh, what do you make of you know, the Manchester bombing that targeted uh, specifically young children and teenagers? Well, this, this seems to mark a new low in, in the tactics, if we can call them that, um, of these uh, perpetrators of terrorism and acts of violence. Um, it would seem that uh, they, they have not gotten uh, as much um, attention as, as they would have liked for themselves, and now uh, they are trying to sow fear in, in the community by uh, targeting the, the most uh, vulnerable uh, elements in our society. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there have been some facts that, that did come up in this incident. The, the Salman, the guy who committed this crime, he was known to be a Muslim. Uh, friends supposedly had reported him to the police for having extremist tendencies. There was a mosque that specifically banned him uh, for having extremist views. And New York, I think it was, yeah, sorry, the Times reported that he was actually known to security services as an associate of ISIS recruiter. So in some ways, you know, there's, uh, there's this big push of the Muslim community needs to condemn these kinds of attacks. Is the fact that the Muslim community and his friends and the community, uh, you know, they did come out and report him, is this in and of itself a form of condemnation, you think? Yes, definitely. It shows that the Muslim community is vigilant and they're doing what they can in, uh, in, in looking at individual cases and uh, weeding out such extremist elements from their midst. And, um, of course, there has to be a, a coordinated effort between the Muslim community on the one hand, the security services on the other hand, uh, and, and these have to go um, hand in hand in, in forwarding the uh, mission of uh, rooting out extremism and, and terrorism and, and violence. Uh, but the, the, the action of uh, such a bomber is so bizarre, um, so unexpected, that even if uh, security services are, are watching a person, uh, they, they don't know what he's going to do until he actually does it. And uh, obviously there are limitations. If somebody comes uh, into the mosque and, and spouts uh, rhetoric, 
uh, he espouses uh, violent tendencies in terms of words, then there's a question, uh, at what point do we report him? Because uh, it, it may, we, we want to not cross a line uh, and, and report a person uh, too early, and we don't want to report too late. So we're always in this kind of um, um, catch-22 situation. And with security services, it's probably the same thing. They don't want to uh, move in too early and, and nab a, a, a suspect, um, especially before you know the, the, a particular crime has been committed, because what are you going to accuse him uh, of in, in the court of law? Um, it, this is not the minority report situation where you know ahead of time for certain that this crime is going to be committed. Um, you almost have to wait and see. And, and then by the time you wait and see, it's uh, too late because the devastating effects of such a bombing is uh, there for everyone to see. But what do you make of reports that have come out that have claimed that you know his friends or there were people who knew that he was planning to do this and so there clearly there's some some miscommunication here between the community and um, you know security services so what's the as a Muslim community what more should we be doing to address sort of clearly this gap uh, apparently the uh, police are still on the hunt for accomplices and people who um, might have uh, um, had a hand in it or knew for certain that this is going to happen. Others uh, may have had some kind of vague idea that uh, you know this person is up to something but without knowing specifically what and when and so on. Um, uh, what more needs to be done? Uh, I, I believe that the Muslim community needs to take this uh, matter seriously and uh, ask why is it that uh, we uh, that a certain element of our society is uh, resorting to, to such violence. Uh, when we say that uh, you know, Muslims are 1.6 billion in, in the world, um, we are quoting that big number to be very inclusive, to include all. Um, then it's, it's a turnaround uh, when some act is committed like this to say, well, okay, that's not us. Well, okay, so it's 1.6 billion min minus all of these uh, violent elements. Uh, so we're not so very clear. Do we include these in our community or not? But what is very clear is that uh, often these are persons uh, who have been associated with mosques, they are using Islamic elements, they have uh, been citing verses of the Quran, um, uh, references to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Islamic tradition. Uh, their goals uh, sometimes are stated as the establishment of an Islamic state. So they're, they're using Islamic terminology and ideas and, and uh, they, they seem to come from within that, that ethos. So Muslims have to seriously ask ourselves, how have we uh, understood and explained Islam in our classical texts throughout our history and how are we doing it now? And, and are we willing to overturn some of the ideas and classical rulings that were there uh, that are giving rise to this kind of violent uh, uh, behavior? Uh, so uh, l let's say that there is a groundwork in which uh, different uh, things could be planted. Mm -hmm. and, and, and let's say we are the good crops that come out of that same soil. But if the same soil is producing some other plants that are poisonous, we have to ask, what do we do with this soil and how do we um, uh, so uh, nurture it and change it so that it only produces the good crop and, and it doesn't produce the poisonous one? So just using that example, in this situation, we know that one mosque actually did shun uh, this individual out from the community. So my question to you now then, is that the approach? We find out someone has extremist views, we see, uh, you know, clues of radicalization is the solution. What was done here to shun them out from the, from the from the mosques specifically. I think a judgment needs to be applied in, on a case by case basis. Um, there was one argument for excluding them in that, okay, uh, so you're not our business anymore. We have nothing to do with you. If uh, anything goes down, we're very clear, you're not us. Uh, so, th so that's uh, exclusion. Uh, the, the other, uh, there's an argument for the other side to say, okay, if you exclude them from the mosques, then they will get their Islam from the internet. And uh, 
in that case, they will turn out to be more extreme than, than what we feared. So they, they, it may be better to include them in the mosque and give them a chance to associate with the moderate Muslims in the mosque so that uh, they uh, will tone down their extremism and become normalized uh, as uh, are other Muslims. So why do you think um, you know, it's easier for these kinds of individuals to fall into the trap of ISIS where you know, they offer redemption and, and the Allah kinda, all those kinds of things? versus our mainstream approach. Why is it that these individuals are more prone to the ISIS narrative versus the mainstream narrative? This goes back to the soil that I, that I spoke about, this kind of bedrock uh, that, that we're all standing on. Uh, so we have a history of the interpretation of Islam and uh, the understanding of how it, w what it means to be Muslim. Uh, so one, one interpretation that is there in our classical history is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, was sent with a mission to dominate the world. Um, and uh, he um, pursued uh, battle with, with the enemies because uh, he was not going to lay low with this message. He had to make sure that this message is heard and that it dominates the land. So he, in fact, instigated battle with, uh, with the enemy. This is one narrative. It's not the narrative that I, ac that I accept, but mm -hmm. it is a narrative that is there in our classical sources. So that uh, uh, young men like, like uh, the bombers that we're hearing about one after another uh, are, are latching on to this because some people have a violent tendency and they're looking for a kind of a violent narrative and to latch on to. And you think they're attracted to this by And default. they're attracted to this, yes. Uh, so uh, we, we have to go back into our um, classical books and, and we have to be very clear uh, to the public and to ourselves and to our youth uh, that mistakes have been made in the interpretation of Islam. This is a mistake. It's a classical one and it is prominent in our sources. Uh, when, when early biographers wrote about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, they compiled uh, lists of battles because to them this is what was the highlight of his mission. Uh, up to recently, there was a famed uh, Pakistani scholar who was traveling the world, traveled, uh, came to Canada many times giving lectures, and, and he was in fact um, promoting um, the, the idea that Muslims need to establish an Islamic state so that we can implement uh, the details of Islamic Sharia, including the penal code of Islam. Uh, so how are you going to do that? Uh, the, the, the other powers are not going to give up their powers just because Muslims want it. How are Muslims going to uh, wrest power from the others? It has to be by a violent struggle. And according to this scholar, uh, this uh, struggle was initiated by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So uh, with, with a kind of narrative like this coming from scholarly individuals who are traveling and giving lectures, and respected by the community as one of our scholars. Uh, the naturally, young people who are uh, gravitating towards violence will latch onto that narrative and, and decide to join uh, calls like that of the Islamic State, thinking that finally we have here the manifestation of what Muslims have generally been hoping for, and uh, it is just that the others don't have the courage to do it, but we have the courage and we'll go ahead. So this is their thinking. So obviously there's a lot here to think about. Just as we wrap up, what, how do we, uh, as not even just as Muslims, but as human beings, cope with all of these bombings, killings that are happening around the world? It's hard, but we, we have to put our trust in God, knowing that in the end, God is in full control of all affairs. And uh, the, the, it is very clear to us in our tradition that God will not uh, give us more than we can bear. And uh, sometimes it uh, takes us right up to the limit and we, we almost reaches a breaking point. Every time one of these bombings uh, occur, we, we hope that this is going to be the last. And we think that there's no sane reason in the world why this should continue. Continue, um, and, and yet it continues. And while we're talking about this uh, Manchester bombing, uh, soon after that there was the report of a bus uh, load of mm. Christians being killed uh, in in Egypt. While well, some many of them were killed, uh, many others uh, wounded. That too is terrible. And things like this should not happen in an Islamic society. Muslims should not be the perpetrators of such violence. We should live in peace and in harmony with other people. Uh, we should love uh, and tolerate. Uh, we should even respect people of other traditions. Um, uh, and when things like this uh, are, are repeated over and over, it does become hard for people in general uh, 
uh, to live with, but it becomes even more difficult for Muslims because not only do we um, reel from all of the uh, horror of violence, but uh, we're also um, recoiling from uh, the reports that link these uh, violent acts with people uh, who claim to be of our faith. I think, despite all that, I think we ended off on a positive note of hope and love. So thank you so much, Dr. Shafir. You're welcome.